This is Malik Kahuk from the University of Colorado, and this is part two of the lecture on cyclophotocoagulation. In part one, we discussed transcleral cyclophotocoagulation. Part two focuses on a more targeted approach known as endoscopic cyclophotocoagulation, or ECP. ECP typically involves a probe that provides laser energy, a camera for imaging, as well as a light source. The approach is to enter the eye through a clear corneal incision underneath the iris and then approach the ciliary processes for applying energy. And again, just as a reminder, this also uses diode laser. The control panel for ECP looks like this. There is a spot to increase power, typically set at 0.25 watts. We also have the ability to control the duration, which we typically set at continuous. You can also control the light as well as the intensity of the aiming beam. I just wanted to list here a few of the different probes. Um, there are both straight and curved probes available as well as different gauges, depending on what you have access to in your specific market. We did some early studies on ECP years ago, looking at the differences between ECP and transcleral cyclophotocoagulation. This particular study was completed when I was at the University of Pittsburgh. This slide shows what normal ciliary processes look like. The arrows are pointing towards the tips of the ciliary processes. The eye indicates the iris and the asterisk is positioned closer to the pars plana. What we're seeing here is normal architecture, and I want you to compare it to the subsequent two slides. This tissue is shown post-ECP treatment, and the only thing that you're seeing that's different is blunting of the tips of the slayer processes. Otherwise, you don't see a great deal of destruction of the surrounding tissues. Compare that to this image, which is post-transcleral cyclophotocoagulation, where the arrow is indicating an area that has been severely disrupted by the diode laser treatment. I think if you go back and forth between the two images, you can see the amount of destruction in ECP versus that seen in transcleral CPC. And this is one of the major factors that pushes me more towards ECP because I have greater control, less destruction. And in this area that you're looking at post CPC, it likely happened during a pop of the tissue that you can hear from time to time and which we try to avoid with CPC but aren't always able to. We're better able to avoid these pops with ECP because of direct visualization and being able to titrate energy in a much more nuanced fashion. Histologically, I also wanted to show some light microscopy. This is what normal ciliary processes look like. The arrowheads are pointing towards the tips of the ciliary processes. Compare that to post-ECP, where, again, you see blunting of the tips of the slayer processes. And then one more time, looking at transcleral CPC, where you see the great deal of destruction, loss of architecture, the lacy nature of the slayer processes is lost, and you can see a separation of the epithelium, both pigmented and non-pigmented, from the stroma of the slayer processes. So just to go back and forth here one more time, this is post-ECP. You don't have a great deal of loss of architecture. The lacy nature is still present, and you don't have a separation of the epithelium, as opposed to post-transcleral CPC, where there's a loss of the architecture, as well as a separation and destruction of the epithelial layers. So we found clear differences in the treated tissue affected by the two lasers. These differences were noted both histologically as well as by scanning electron microscopy. The findings on light microscopy as well as SEM have really dictated which patients I might use ECP in versus those where I might use CPC. ECP is used as replacement for medical therapy. If I'm doing cataract surgery and the patient's on two or three medications, I'll do ECP to try and get them off of one or two of their medications. I'll typically use ECP in patients who have failed TRAB or who have a functioning glaucoma drainage device the pressure is not quite at goal, and I don't want to put another tube in place. In those cases, ECP does really well. In patients who are poor bleb candidates because of conjunctival scarring, any indication where transcleral CPC might have been used prior, typically ECP still applies. In patients who are post-KPRO, corneal transplant patients, they tend to do well with ECP. 
Again, congenital glaucoma is an area that's very tough to treat and has been the focus of many lectures. In this case, I'll just say that ECP has been used extensively in congenital glaucoma and has been quite successful. It's also ideal to use ECP in aphakic or vitrectomized eyes compared to doing penetrating surgery where the risk of choroidal hemorrhage is significant. Pre-op regimen, phenylephrine, cyclogel, NSAID, very, very typical of what you might do with cataract surgery, including a fourth generation fluoroquinolone or whichever antibiotic might be available to you. Lidocaine gel for topical anesthetic, plus or minus block. And with ECP, it really depends on your experience as well as who you have doing your anesthesia. If you have a good anesthesiologist that has practice with ECP, you can typically get away with a topical approach augmented by the anesthesiologist giving medications like propofol for a short period of time. You can also augment with intracameral lidocaine to decrease the sensitivity to the laser. Of course, you always have the option of doing a retrobulbar or a peribulbar anesthetic, which I do from time to time depending on the patient. From a treatment step standpoint, I use a temporal clear corneal incision of around 2.4 millimeters. You can, of course, use a larger incision if that's what you're used to. And in the case of a 2.2 millimeter incision, while you can perform the procedure, you might have a greater tendency to get or locking where the probe is moving the globe from side to side as you're trying to reach a wider degree of ciliary processes. Inflate the sulcus with a cohesive viscoelastic. I tend to use Helon GV. Helon GV does a good job of elevating the iris off of the ciliary processes and maintaining your space for treatment. If the patient is aphakic or in pediatric eyes, consider using an anterior chamber maintainer with continuous balanced salt solution irrigation. Initial laser settings 0.25 watts on continuous mode. I adjust illumination to visualize the aiming beam. Endpoint is whitening and shrinkage of the ciliary processes, and I advocate for a painting motion rather than treating one ciliary process at a time. I advocate for a movement from side to side with a painting motion over 270 to 360 degrees, and I'll show that illustrated in a video here soon. Try and avoid popping at all costs. If you have popping, you're essentially mimicking CPC, and that takes away the major benefit of ECP, which is targeted less traumatic treatment. One of the ways to ensure that you're at a proper distance from the ciliary processes is to count how many you see in your view. The ideal distance from the ciliary processes is two millimeters. And if you're two millimeters away, you're counting approximately six ciliary processes in your view. So I'm constantly counting to make sure that I'm at proper distance. And I think this is a nice way, it's a nice pearl for practice to know that you're far enough away and you're not too close to the ciliary processes. Here's a video just showing the painting motion. You can see the contracting, the whitening, and the shrinkage of the ciliary processes. And I don't take my foot off the pedal. I'm continuously painting back and forth. And towards the end of the 360 degrees, I'll go back and paint the 360 degrees one more time. Each time you see a shrinking of the ciliary processes, you're exposing more of the ciliary epithelium that you might not have a view of prior to the contracting to the shrinkage of the ciliary processes. So remember, keep your foot down on the pedal, use a painting motion, wait for the whitening and shrinkage of the ciliary processes so that you can get the epithelium that's in between the ciliary processes, and then consider a retreatment after you do the first sweep of the 360 degrees. Post-procedure, thorough viscoelastic removal is important so that you don't get an IOP spike. Remember that we're not removing the trabecular meshwork, we're not doing a sclerotomy that we might do with a trabeculectomy. So in this case, removal of the viscoelastic is extremely important. Postoperatively, prednisolone QID for four weeks, NSAID QID until finished with a bottle, fourth generation fluoroquinolone or any fluoroquinolone that you might have access to QID until finished, and then place a patch if the patient has been blocked. You'll notice that I use NSAID and antibiotic until the bottle is finished for simplicity. However, many surgeons choose to use it for one to two weeks and then stop. It's really your same practice pattern that you use for cataract surgery is what you should use for ECP. In some cases, the inflammation might be longer lasting, and in that case, you can titrate the prednisolone as you see fit. Glaucoma medications are restarted and then discontinued as needed. I typically look for a pressure above or below 15. If the pressure is above 15, I'll start the patient back on all of their medications. If the pressure is below 15, then I take it on a case-by-case -case basis, depending on what the optic nerve looks like. IOP will not drop immediately as it does with trabeculectomy. The IOP might fluctuate during the first two weeks, and I think that's really important to keep in mind. 
The ultimate post ECP pressure will be identified between weeks two and eight. One of the things you might have noted from the previous slides is I keep referring to 360 degrees of treatment. We did a study at the University of Pittsburgh looking at the utility of two-site versus one-site ECP. Two-site was to treat 360 degrees. One-site was to treat approximately 270 to 300 degrees. We noted that medications decreased more significantly in the 360-degree treatment group and we also noted a greater reduction in intraocular pressure in the patients with 360 degrees of treatment. Does ECP work if not combined with cataract surgery? The simple answer is yes. However, ECP plus phaco emulsification is more effective than standalone ECP in lowering intraocular pressure. You can see here in group one, which was ECP with phaco emulsification, pressure dropped from 24 to 14 as opposed to standalone ECP, which was group two, where the pressure dropped from 23 to 18. ECP with phaco emulsification resulted in more statistically significant IOP lowering compared to ECP alone, and ECP without phaco emulsification still resulted in a significant reduction in IOP. I'd encourage you to go to this link, which is on the Endo Optics website, to look at a list of ECP studies that might be of interest to you. And some considerations that I think are important here with ECP, always perform ECP after the cataract surgery and not before. It's quite difficult to do ECP in a phacic patient. It's also impossible to reach all of the epithelium on the ciliary processes. The key is to use enough viscoelastic to elevate the iris off of the ciliary processes so that you have a good view and that there's no risk of the iris falling in front of the probe. Take your time with painting the ciliary processes as I noted. Create a second clear corneal incision supranasally to treat 360 degrees of the ciliary processes. Take your time in removing the viscoelastic to avoid postoperative spikes. And the final IOP is typically in the mid to high teens and reach two to eight weeks after treatment. Some conclusions for ECP. ECP can be effective with proper patient selection. Proper technique is a must, which I've repeated over and over again. Two-site surgery leads to lower IOP compared to one site. There have been many studies looking at ECP with phaco emulsification, but few studies comparing ECP to transcleral cyclophotocoagulation. This study by Rodriguez and colleagues compared the two and found that phaco with transcleral CPC could be considered as a simple and economical alternative treatment for patients with medically uncontrolled glaucoma, particularly where access to ECP or other minimally invasive procedures requiring subspecialist expertise might be limited. Some of the surprising findings in this study included that IOP was significantly lower in the TCP group of patients, that's transcleral CPC. And perhaps more surprising was that the adverse event profile was similar between the groups. I typically think of CPC transclerally as having more of an adverse event risk, whereas this study found it to be pretty equivalent between ECP and CPC. Back to our patient, Mr. JC, again, is the 73-year-old phacic Latino male who had failed trabeculectomy and glaucoma drainage device and had pressures of 26 and 24 on maximal tolerated medical therapy with a goal in the low teens. What is the next step? In my practice, typically what I would do in this patient is cataract surgery plus ECP with maybe another angle procedure like goniotomy to decrease the pressure to what our goal is. However, if this patient came in and was pseudophagic, I would still consider ECP plus or minus goniotomy. And if ECP were not available, I think CPC, whether it's micropulse or the traditional transcleral continuous wave diode laser, should still be considered as a viable and safe choice. I also wanted to emphasize that we're in a new era where multiple lasers are available to treat the spectrum of disease from mild to severe glaucoma. We can utilize SLT for mild to moderate glaucoma, and this has been quite successful even as primary therapy as shown in the most recent light study reports. ECP can be used either standalone or combined with phaco emulsification for mild to moderate glaucoma as well. And then as you move towards the later stages of moderate and into severe glaucoma, both micropulse and traditional CPC can be viewed as options. Whether micropulse has less adverse events and should be more appropriate for moderate glaucoma compared to traditional CPC is still something that is up for debate 
and hopefully evidence-based medicine will conclude that debate. I do want to highlight some further reading and resources. You can go to keogt.com. This is also available on the Orbis CyberSite Library. Please visit Sidra Tree Foundation to look at some of the resources that we have available for lower resource areas around the world. I invite you to follow on malik.kahook underscore md for videos and lectures and the YouTube channel where I post most of these lectures, which is linked below.